Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Okay, welcome back to the Ancient Christian Writer series, and we're picking up with our reading of St. John Cassian's conferences. We're currently reading the 21st conference on the relaxation at Pentecost, so he's speaking in particular about uh, the relaxation of specific ascetical disciplines during uh, this fest, uh, festive season. But uh, as we said, this is really more of a background for a deeper discussion of living in accord with uh, uh, not the law, but rather the grace of God. Looking at our life now in light of what we've become in and through Christ. So not simply being subject to the law, but rather now being lifted up to share in the very life of God. And so... Uh, called to give of ourselves in light of our true dignity and identity in Christ. And as we've seen already, uh, this can mean some radical changes in one's life, the way that we view everything about who we are as human beings. And the last couple of times we've been speaking about how we would look at marriage and uh, also chastity within the context of marriage, that a Christian marriage would uh, be distinctively different from uh, simply marriage within, within the world, that uh, the relationship touched by the grace of God and by those who have sought purity of heart and engage each other in that chastity is going to be reflective of Christ's love for his bride, the church. And so where we are to be living our lives is to be at this much higher level, not judging our lives only in accord with human uh, standards or our own sens sensitivities and sensibilities, but now uh, in accord with the standard of the cross. And this uh, can be very jarring, at least it was, I think, in our reading of the first uh, few sections of, of this conference. Uh, in particular because of the example given of Theonas the elder, the main elder in this conference, who was married, but had been sort of pushed into marriage with the thought that uh, simply the, the marriage according to the law would also be, as it were, a cure for the passions. And so they had entered into this marriage uh, in good faith, but legally, not uh, spiritually, in the sense of embracing each other in Christ. And he's caught up then in a kind of spiritual conflict. Uh, he presents to his wife the idea of uh, seeking to uh, embrace each other, uh, but now in the context of that relationship with Christ and the holiness to which they are called. And even uh, for a period of time of embracing uh, a life of uh, celibacy in order that their hearts might be purified and formed in accord with, with the gospel, that they might first achieve a kind of purity of heart that Cassian sets out at the beginning of this work, and then be able to embrace each other within the context of marriage now so that it might be a source of grace for them. And there's a struggle that takes place between the two of them. One is not willing to do that. And, and so Theonis is caught in a kind of spiritual mind, you know, to pursue the holiness that we are called to in Christ or to remain faithful to, you know, by law to the marriage that he had entered into with his wife. And this really, I think he gives this example uh, in order to highlight what we're going to be talking about now, where are we really, again, to be living our lives? That there is something about our living our life in Christ that is meant to lift us out of purely worldly or carnal, fulfilling worldly or carnal desires. That those are a part of our lives, but we are to be elevated by grace now. And that might mean radical changes in our lifestyle. And we've come across this again and again as we've gone through the conferences, that uh, we are to bear witness to something far greater and not to simply by, be formed by the world, but 
show that we've been formed by the grace of God and formed by the love of the cross. And for all of us, that means perhaps not embracing or exposing our things to ourselves to things that people in the world would see as legitimate forms of pleasure, because we know that in some sense that might jeopardize us in, in terms of the holiness to which we've been called. Okay. Any uh, thoughts or questions before we move on? Oh, yes. I mean, mm -hmm. Just uh, I'll just real quickly, it's something I said in an earlier mm -hmm. class that since, since since we've all just gone through the Easter Vigil together, mm -hmm. the the remembrance of our our baptismal vows and mm -hmm. and turning away from um, Satan and his empty show. Right. Know, sort of the fourth base level, and then yeah, up, on up. A reminding of ourselves of our vows of our commitments. And then all this week in the readings, we find Christ uh, reminding them that suffering was part of, of this love and what brought about the salvation and our redemption, and that we are called to participate in that in a radical way. Not only should they not be disturbed by it, but they should now be willing to walk in the path and on the path of their master, be willing to embrace the cross in their own life, not to fear it, but to see it as a vehicle of, of love and redemption. We're picking up this evening on page 727, section 11, down towards the bottom of the page. And again, it takes a little bit of patience to follow him where he's going here. It's not, uh, at points it gets a little bit confusing, and uh, we'll make our way through it, though. But it is now time for us to follow the plan of the promised discussion. It was during the days of Pentecost, then, that Abathionis visited us in our cell. And when evening prayers were over, and we had been sitting for a short while on the ground, we began to question him in considerable detail as to why they were so careful that no one ever kneel in prayer during all of Pentecost or presume to fast until the ninth hour. And we sought to understand this with so much more diligence because we had never seen it observed with such care in the monasteries of Syria. Thereupon, Apathionis began to speak as follows. It certainly behooves us, even when the reason for it has not been grasped, to yield to the authority of the fathers and to a custom of our forebears, which has existed for so many years up until our own day, and to maintain it as it has been passed on of old by a constant and reverent observance. But since you want to know the causes and the reason for this, listen for a short while to what has been passed down by our elders about this custom. Before the authority of the divine scriptures is produced, however, we should say a little, if you are willing, about the nature and character of fasting, so that subsequent authority of scripture may be confirmed what we, may confirm what we have said. In Ecclesiastes, the divine wisdom has indicated that there is an appropriate time for everything, that is for all things, whether they be fortunate or be considered unfortunate and sad. As it is said, as it says, there is a time for all things, and a time for everything under heaven, a time for bringing forth and a time for dying, a time for planting and a time for uprooting what was planted, a time for killing and a time for healing, a time for destroying and a time for building, a time for weeping and a time for laughing, a time for mourning and a time for dancing a time for casting stones, and a time for gathering stones, a time for embracing, a time to be far from embracing, a time for acquiring, and a time for losing, a time for keeping, and a time for throwing away, a time for breaking, and a time for repairing, a time for being silent, and a time for speaking, a time for loving, and a time for hating, a time for war and a time for peace. And a little later it says that there is a time for everything and for every deed. 
And so he's setting up here for us that, you know, with the liturgical year, we uh, begin to see that there is a time for rejoicing, that as we've entered into uh, the period of Lent where the discipline is great and we enter into the spirit and embrace the spirit of repentance more fully and a, a kind of mourning for our sins, we also come to know the joy of the resurrection, of knowing ourselves as being redeemed by Christ. And that should be reflected in the way that we, we live out our spiritual disciplines. Uh, now, as we go along, we'll, we'll see that it means far, something far different than perhaps what we're used to seeing among modern Christians, that uh, the coming of Easter and Pentecost is not uh, a casting off of ascetical disciplines. Uh, but rather a, moder a moderation of them, and a moderating of them with a kind of discretion as well, that we don't want to jeopardize ourselves spiritually even while we are rejoicing over the events that we have just celebrated. And this is an important point, because I think it's lost among many modern Christians uh, that this should be the case, that a kind of dis discretion should be there, but also that repentance and ascetical discipline should be a regular part of our spiritual life. And then indeed, this will be a part of his explanation here further on in the text, that it's the regularity of our embrace of discipline. And it's the fact that repentance is a way of life that allows us then to moderate it with ease and without any anxiety about it. Because to moderate it at various times uh, of the year during the special seasons or when we offer hospitality to someone else is not going to be something that throws us off of the spiritual path. But if we do it indiscriminately, if we simply set it aside altogether and fall into gluttony and stop fasting for a long period of time, then what we are going to see is ourselves falling back into familiar patterns or coming uh, under the grip of certain passions once more. Okay. But this is what he's setting up, that there indeed is a time for everything. And so we can you know, be at peace about that. We don't want to make fasting an end in itself. It opens us up to that path that leads to the end, which is the capacity to love more fully, that we create, as we said, a deep hunger for Christ within us, and so our fasting helps us to yearn for him, to hunger for him even more. But we don't want to make the practice an end, to exalt it in a way that it should not be exalted. Fasting doesn't bring us salvation. It's love that brings us to salvation. Is that fairly clear so far? Okay. Paragraph four. It has therefore been determined that none of these things is a permanent good, except when it is carried out at the right time and correct fashion. Thus the very things that turn out well now, since we, they were done at the right time, are found to be disadvantageous and harmful if they are tried at an inopportune and inappropriate moment. <coughs> The only exception to this is those things that are essentially and of themselves either good or bad and that can never be turned to their contraries, such as justice, prudence, fortitude, temperance, and the other virtues, and so on, and so on. And, on the other hand, the vices which can never be understood differently. But if they can sometimes have different effects, so that they are found to be good or bad in accordance with the character of those who are exercising them, they are perceived not in absolute terms relative to their nature, but as sometimes, dis I'm sorry, as sometimes advantageous and sometimes harmful in keeping with the disposition of the one exercising them and with the opportuneness of the moment. So there could actually be situations where fasting has an ill effect, where, we'll just use the example of hospitality, that we would, someone would, 
visit, and uh, we would want to show them hospitality so to, in, to feed them. But if we were so caught up at, uh, in fasting as an end in itself, uh, we might be unyielding in our willingness to show that hospitality that would be expected and prompted by love. And so this would be, you know, one instance then where we would say, okay, you know, if I'm fasting all the time anyways, regularly as part of my spiritual life, to break it in, because providence has brought about this set of circumstances, I can be perfectly at ease about it. My conscience shouldn't bother me. Okay. Hence, we should now pursue the question about the practice of fasting and see whether it, too, is a good in the same way that we have spoken of justice, prudence, fortitude, and temperance, which can never become their contraries, or whether it is something indifferent, which can be beneficial when it is sometimes done and cannot be condemned when it is sometimes left undone, and which never to have done is blameworthy and never to have left undone is praiseworthy. Two, if we include fasting among those things that are understood as virtues <clears throat> by placing abstinence from food among the essential goods, then eating will be utterly evil and sinful. For whatever is contrary to an essential good is certainly to be considered essentially evil. The authority of Holy Scripture does not permit us to say this, because if we fast with such an understanding, an attitude, as to believe that we commit sin when we eat, then not only do we gain no fruit from our abstinence, but according to the apostle, we even bring upon ourselves very grave guilt and the crime of sacrilege. They abstain from food that God created to be eaten with thanksgiving by the faithful and by those who know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be rejected that is received with thanksgiving. For whoever thinks that a thing is common, to him it is common. Therefore we read that no one is condemned merely for eating food, unless perchance something is joined or added to it afterward that would justify his condemnation. So again, you know, conscience shouldn't bother us when, our, uh, when we give up abstinence for a period of time, unless there's something uh, particularly sinful that is tied to that. Yes. I had, a, I had a friend who was a, a vow religious who also during feasts would were for saying that this was a time of like reverse ascesis, that it, you are obligated to to feast mm -hmm. and to somehow abstain for any any kind of reason actually is not appropriate. Mm -hmm. it's, it's this, we're celebrating the life of a saint or whatever. Right. We're not supposed to hurt ourselves, but we're not supposed to gorge. Right. And, but I think this is where, where today, because of the irregularity mm -hmm. of our practice, is where we get into the, the problem that, you know, to say, okay, you have to. And, you know, I think some would hear that, that we would have to really feast in the sense of eating in you know, this abundance that is almost grotesque, this gluttonous, yeah. that we need to go to the, you know, the, what do they call those the, in the restaurants, the, the bar, yeah. buffet, yeah, and just like fill up plate after plate in order to really be celebrating. That somehow uh, to celebrate and to feast means that we would be indiscreet in the amount that we would eat. And this, you know, spiritually, I think we are called to look at that a little more closely and say, yes, we would want to celebrate and even be able to lighten our, our fast. But, you know, what, what could actually be harmful to us? And, you know, you know, maybe if we gain 15 pounds over the Christmas break, there's a little bit of a problem there. You know, that that's not feasting over, you know, the, the birth of Christ, but it's eating to the point of gluttony, 
that we're overeating to the extent that we not only jeopardize our health, but then spiritually we have to ask ourselves, what would really be the impact upon that, uh, on our spiritual life? And many people during holidays like that will go on a kind of spiritual va vacation. They'll lose the, the, the drive, the desire to enter into prayer. And part of it, we would have to think, is a kind of disorder that often overcomes a person's life. You know, laying on the couch, watching inordinate amount of television, you know, just having so much of an abundance of food available that they're eating constantly throughout the course of the day, that that is certainly going to have a negative effect upon their, their spiritual life. And so it is important, I think, that we sit back and ask ourselves, you know, how are we engaging in the ascetical life? How do we even view something like feasting? Here we are in the Easter octave. You know, what, what is really appropriate for, for us? And again, in the West, maybe it is harder for us to really do that because we have food in such abundance and we're used to these meals where they aren't human portions. <laughs> you know, that they're just so enormous that it's, again, it's not healthy. I and mean, whenever you go to a restaurant, you know, typically what you get, it's sort of surprising when people travel. If you go to like Italy or something like that and you'll get a little piece of meat <laughs> on your plate and it seems so small, I was like, Goodness sake, you know, how am I going <laughs> to... And we're used to having, like, these 16-ounce steaks or something like that. And so to, you know, talk about, you know, maintaining, uh, you know, a kind of appropriateness in regards to portion and maybe even food, type of food, in our even in our fasting, is something that most of us probably wouldn't think about. You know, religious or laity alike. I mean, I think it's just, you know, I think we would probably take that attitude. Okay, it's a fe feast day. You have to let go of those practices. and But often that will mean <clears throat> being indiscriminate in one's behavior. Yeah. I was thinking more of the brother who would sit there and still stick with his you know, little pile of peas. Oh, yeah. Half a crust of bread. That's right. And it's like, Right, that's right. And I, I think Cassian is very precise. This is what makes him such a wonderful teacher because he does say that, you know, if we do make fasting an end in itself, then there is something wrong with us, that our judgment is off here and that eventually that would lead us into grave harm. Okay. So let's just go along and see where he takes us here. I'm sorry, where did I leave off? 14. And so this appears quite clearly to be something indifferent from the fact that just as it makes a person righteous when it is observed, so it does not condemn him when it is interrupted, unless perchance it is the transgression of a precept that is being punished rather than eating. But there must be no time that is bereft of essential goods. It is not permitted anyone to be without them, because their absence, in their absence, the neglectful person inevitably falls into wickedness. Nor, on the other hand, is any time to be given to an essential evil, because that which is always harmful can never, once it has been done, not be harmful or change into something praiseworthy. And this is important, too. You know, we give ourselves certain liberties, you know, now, We've lost a very clear sense of what we should really be exposing ourselves to. Uh, maybe uh, an easy example would be movies nowadays, that anything, even like PG-13 sometimes, can go you know, far beyond what would be acceptable. But we've, there can be this acceptance of exposing ourselves to what would be very graphic sexual images or graphic violent images. And we have to ask ourselves, is there really any time 
when doing something like that would be acceptable in, in the sense of the impact that that would have upon us, knowing how it affects the mind, the imagination. You know, we're all, we always hear people saying, well, it sort of, it did add to the story, you know, and so it was appropriate for, you know, what was, you know, taking place in the movie. But, uh, you know, we really have, if we're seeking that purity of heart, that Cassian puts forward at the beginning of the work, then is there really any at any time when that would be <clears throat> acceptable to expose ourselves to it, knowing the impact that it could have upon us? You know, is our conscience that sensitive that we would seek to avoid it as something that we would never want to expose ourselves to? Yes. I mean, don't you get desensitized after a while? I think so. I mean, I think that's part of it. We get so used to telling ourselves it's no big deal uh, and because our consciences aren't refined that they can become sort of dull and, and coarse. And so we will allow ourselves, you know, for the sake of entertainment to expose ourselves to things in moments of better judgment that we wouldn't. And I think we all know well enough how things stay within the mind and the imagination, the memory. And that once there, not, it's not easily removed. And how would that be in the eyes of God? That if we are temples of the Holy Spirit, if we're temples of God, you know, if the same eyes gaze upon the Holy Eucharist, you know, then what should they be gazing upon, you know, at other times? Number two, therefore the things for which we see that conditions and times have been fixed and which sanctify and when they are observed but do not do damage, when they are omitted are obviously indifferent, such as marriage, farming, wealth, the solitude of the desert, vigils, the reading of and meditation on Holy Scripture and fasting itself, which is how this discussion started. No divine precept and no authority in Holy Scripture is decreed that any of these are to be pursued so incessantly and maintained so constantly that not occupying oneself with them for a short while is wicked. For whatever is decreed in the form of a command brings death with it, death with it if it is not carried out, whereas whatever is recommended rather than commanded is of benefit when done. But the not doing of it is not punishable. Consequently, our forebears ordered us to do carefully all these things, or at least some of them, in keeping with the situation, the place, the method, and the time, and to observe them thoughtfully, because in any of these, if any of these is done properly, it is useful and good, but if improperly, it is harmful and dangerous. Any thoughts on that? And so, you know, even I was wondering if anyone would, would, would sort of notice the fact that marriage was part of that list. <laughs> well, I did, and, but then the solitude of the desert was too, and so it seemed pretty. Right. Yeah, that those things. You know, we're not commanded to do that, that our salvation is independent upon whether or not we find a spouse. You know, we might have that desire, and, but that might not ever be the case. And, you know, our desire you know, to live in union communion with God should be the overpowering thing in our life. And if it's granted to us to have that particular good, then wonderful. But uh, we shouldn't necessarily be overly saddened by that, as if our, the value of our life is dependent or determined by it. If someone wants to maintain an austere fast when a brother comes in whom he should refresh Christ hospi hospitably and embrace him with a most gracious welcome, would he not be committing a sin of inhospitality 
rather than gaining the praise and virtue of religious devotion, or if someone refuses to relax a rigorous abstinence when fleshly weakness and frailty demand that he recruit his strength by taking some food, should he not be considered the cruel murderer of his own body rather than the procurer of his salvation? Likewise, when a time of celebration permits the pleasant glow that comes with, from eating and a meal that is necessarily abundant, if someone wishes to hold to a rigid and unbroken fast, it will certainly be seen not as devout, but as confused and irrational. So we don't want to fast ourselves into sickness or to death. And certainly there were monks who did that. There are plenty of stories, and, uh, or those who were sick who would refuse to give themselves ne necessarily, necessary sustenance in order to regain health. And even some of the great saints would admit that in their youth they overdid it. Uh, John Vianney uh, was, was one. You know, he was a great faster and saw it as very important. But there were times that he, he admitted in his youth that uh, he had overdone it and so paid the price physically when he was older, uh, that he had pushed too hard. Mm -hmm. It's a hard thing because I think, like we've spoken before about how the complete lack of willingness to break from the rigidity of like a certain practice can betray like the real depth of the, the weakness there. But, but it is kind of hard to enter into an arena where you feel very strongly like, I'm going to lose. Like, like uh... Like me and desserts. <laughs> like, it's so much easier to just not have any at all. Like, it's just so much easier. Because the moment the dessert's there, it's like brownie sundaes all week. <laughs> and, um, and hedgehogs. And, you know, so it can feel like it's just the better, safer thing. Just, I'm not going to have any because... The moment it's present at all, you know, and mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to to accept the necessity of entering into the arena, sort of, you know. Mm -hmm. It's easier to just stay outside where it's safe. Well, in some sense, that's true. Again, we are so used to having, you know, th foods that are so rich. So not only amount of food but foods that are so rich and sweet that they're a constant part of our day-to-day -day life. And so we're constantly eating things that perhaps aren't the best for our spiritual life. That's a hard thing to think about because, again, of the abundance. Like all of our cupboards are filled with, you know, bags of cookies and stuff like that. And, <laughs> and so the idea of saying, well, spiritually, I know that that's not... That's really not a necessary food for me to have. And that perhaps I struggle to maintain a kind of discipline with that because of the nature of the food. So I might, you know, that I'll sit down and eat a bag of Oreos or whatever it might be, you know. Uh, and so I make a decision that I'm just not, I'm not going to eat that kind of food. Uh, or, you know, in general, but still on special occasions, you know, it's Easter, <laughs> we might eat a hedgehog cookie like we have there <laughs> and not, not be concerned about that. And it's interesting, there's a movie called Therese, it was made back in 1983, it's French, and uh, somebody delivers uh, sort of like a case of nice things for them. It was Christmas or Easter, I can't remember which it was. It was Christmas. And uh, it was like a couple bottles of champagne. But it was for the whole group of them. And so they all have this, you know, a couple of champagne. And they're not used to drinking it. So the next thing you know, they're all sort of singing and dancing with each other <laughs> around the room and <laughs> celebrating. 
and to the point that Therese herself becomes like a little woozy. Because, yes. Yeah. Well, it's a movie, you know. It's it takes some uh, uh, because she was already ill at that point. But they were laughing, you know. Nothing sinful about it. They were, it was a joyful moment, and I thought, well, that it was a nice sort of thing. It showed, you know, here in the Carmel, they lived this radically disciplined life. But somebody gave them this gift, and they were able to receive it and enjoy it. But you could see that they weren't, you know, champagne drinkers. They weren't drinking champagne every day where they built up a tolerance. That one little cup made them tipsy. And so I think when we look at food, you know, again, food is such an important part of Western culture. And not like it is in some other cultures where it's important and valuable in the sense that it creates this community to sit down and share a common meal is, a, you know, a good thing. But for us, it's often eating in abundance very quickly, often not even very social at all. And we, again, we don't ask ourselves, you know, are there certain foods that really we would not want to have a, as a part of our diet because of the effect that they would have on us spiritually? That if we can't pray after we eat dinner, you know, is often a sign that we've eaten too much. You know, because if we fill our belly to such an extent that all the blood rushes there and we get fatigued and we, you know, can't go into the chapel and pray, then, you know, maybe, maybe we need to look at that and say, perhaps I need to adjust the portions that I have. So, I know this might seem a little bit much, but I think it is, you know, I think he's making some pretty important points here, that if we are, again, seeking that purity of heart, that we're seeking to live the life of grace, you know, to be in that as fully as we possibly can, then that touches the way that we look at everything human, including how we eat. Because it's changed the way that we look at fasting, how we look at not eating, too. That forever now, it's tied up with our longing and desire for Christ. When the bridegroom is taken away, then they will fast. It's no longer just for repentance, self-discipline, but now it's tied with this longing for Christ, and it's something that deepens prayer. So our not eating changes, but so does how we, you know, how we eat that we would do that with a kind of discretion so that we avoid vice, the vice of gluttony. I feel like I, you know, find every excuse not to fast or to, like I would love to get to the point where I do feel super uncomfortable because I was <laughs> so good, you know, so true to, to a fast. So like this is, maybe this is making me feel a little more guilty. Well, Climacus was good about that too. You know, he said, you know, there are some monks that, you know, when it comes time for prayer, you know, they, you know, they drag themselves to the chapel and they get sleepy. But as soon as the dinner bell rings, they're full of energy and they're running into the refectory. You know? And we do, I think that's a perfect image, though, that we sort of want to turn, be able to turn that around, where the truly spiritual person is, you know, going to see eating as a necessity and not necessarily a bad thing, but is going to be more restrained there. And, but when the time for prayer comes, that there would be, you know, develop over time a deep yearning for that, a longing for the next time that we're able to receive the Holy Eucharist or the next time that we're able to engage in adoration. That for those who are seekers of Christ and want to live that life fully, you know, what's going to be a priority for us what we are going to long for the most is going to be reflected in our day-to-day -day attitudes. So giving up fasting would not be something that one would want to easily do, that we would want to have this sense, uh, you know, I know the importance and value of this, how it does deepen prayer. So you know, if we find ourselves, ha you know, indiscriminately giving it up or being in these situations that are constantly pulling us out of it, you know, if we're having to go out to, to dinner parties every, every night of the week, 
you know, because of our work, then, you know, we might think about changing our work. You know, certainly our spiritual life is more important and more valuable than, you know, a life that might pull us into excess. And, you know, in our culture, those who are admired are those who are the wealthiest, most powerful, and those who seem to have all those things as a part of their day-to-day -day life. Whereas for the Christian, we would be seeking simplicity in order to be able to maintain, you know, that connection with Christ. To avoid a pressurized life that makes, you know, our going to prayer an impossibility. And again, in Western culture, that's pretty difficult, you know because it seems to thrive on that pressure. People who work hard, in fact, who work to the point of exhaustion are admired. You know, but what does that really, why are they doing that? And what impact does that really have on their spiritual life? Their capacity to love God or to love others, you know, if work becomes their life. Where are we at here? I'm, I've lost my... Number five, <clears throat> but these things will also be found problematic by those who are on the watch for human praise because of their fasting and who are acquiring a reputation for holiness because of their vain and showy pallor. The words of the gospel declare that such people have received their reward in the present and the Lord curses their fasting by the prophet. First he speaks in their person and reproaches himself. Why have we fasted and you have not noticed? Why have we humiliated our souls and you were unaware? Then at once he answers, giving the reasons why they do not deserve to be heard. Behold, he says, in the days of your fasting, your own will is found and you make exactions of all your debtors. Behold, you fast for arguments and contention and you strike wickedly with the fist. Do not fast as you have up until this day, that your cry may be heard on high. Is such the fast that I have chosen for a person to afflict his soul for a day, to turn his head like a circle and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Will you call that a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Then he begins to teach how a faster's abstinence may become acceptable and he says clearly that fasting by itself cannot have any value unless the following conditions are joined to it. Is it not this the fast that I have chosen, he says? Loose the bonds of wickedness. Undo the oppressive bundles. Let those who are broken go free and smash every burden. Break your bread for the hungry and bring the needy and the wandering into your house. When you see someone naked, cover him and do not despise your own flesh. Then your light shall burst forth like the morning and your health shall swiftly rise and your righteousness shall go before your face and the glory of the Lord shall gather you up. Then you shall call and the Lord shall hear you. You shall cry out and he shall say, Behold, here I am. So our fasting should be something that increases our capacity and desire to love God and love our neighbor, Christ in our midst. It should make us more attentive and, and as it were, hungry to, to serve others with a kind of compassion. And if our fasting is simply turned in on ourselves, where we're, you know, we're trying to create a showy pallor, so we want to look pale, and gaunt, so people see us as ascetics, then there's something wrong with us. And so, you know, we don't want to, you know, just take up the, uh, the life of asceticism cut off from that relationship with Christ and the desire for him and the desire to love him and others. <coughs> You see then that fasting is by no means considered an essential good by the Lord inasmuch as it does not become good 
and pleasing to God by itself, but in conjunction with other works. On the other hand, by reason of accessory circumstances, it might be considered not only vain, but even hateful, as the Lord says. When they fast, I will not hear their prayers. So, you know, it's, as James said, you know, you ask, but you do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to satisfy your own baser needs. So, you know, we might fast not in a prayerful way, not in the right way, but really to satisfy a hunger for a self-image of being spiritually disciplined, you know, or having a sense of ourselves as being religious, not because we really are hungering for the Lord and want to be able to deepen our prayer, or in the experience of our own hunger, be more attuned to the hunger of others, whether it be physical hunger or emotional hunger, you know, that we would be more attuned to the needs of others. Yes? There seems to be something about um, sluggishness that um, happens to a person um, with, with excess, whether it's, it's food or even like the visual stimulation from TV or movies. I was thinking we went to a um, retreat a couple years ago at St. Mm-hmm. Vincent's, you know, and on Sunday they had a really nice lunch buffet, mm-hmm. right? And you're having a nice lunch, and some of the priests and monks come in. And this little monk came and he sat at our table. He looked about like the size of a boy, right? And he was the happiest, most joyful. PhD, he just talked regular English, you know? But he was sitting right next to me, and he went off and got a little bit of greens, you know, and salad. And they took some peanut butter and they scraped it on top of the salad and sat there and ate that. But he had no bird. He was just as active and as bright and as clean and as joyful. There was not that sluggishness from overstimulation. You know, there was something really free about it. Right. Well, you know, even our watching those things at night has an effect upon the brain, and it keeps us from falling asleep. You know, the intensity of those images or even the light from it, you know, can be, have such an effect that it overstimulates that we aren't then able to sleep as, as we should. And, but you're right, I mean, just in general, that those things can make us sluggish spiritually and less attentive to, you know, those who are in our midst, being able to engage them, that we're so caught up with things that we've, that are going on in our life or things that we've seen that we become blind to the, maybe the more subtle things or a person who might be in our midst who's going through a difficult time and we're just, our, our minds have been so filled with other things that they can't be attentive to maybe even what's more important, which often isn't going to be the most visible thing. Sometimes the more important things are sort of hidden or subtle. And so a person who ha- has silence in their life is going to become ever more attentive to that. It was, I think Kierkegaard said something. You know, if I were a doctor and I was asked to prescribe one thing for people's health, it would be silence. That, you know, in the, it does allow us to be attentive to the most important things, certainly our relationship with God, but certainly to the other things within this world that are more attentive, that are more important as well. Yeah, when we get over-programmed and things like that, you know, it can just make us completely inaccessible to people. Like busyness can be a defense mechanism. And so we can sort of fill, the church can do this too, you know, where we can have all these programs and be very busy looking, active, but maybe not attentive what we need to be attentive to. You know, a priest needs to be able to sit in the confessional even when nobody's coming to 
confession because there might be someone who comes who really does need it or to be able to be accessible and available at the rectory or you know for someone who walks in unscheduled and be able because because they might be in the most intense crisis or the call when somebody's dying and needs last rites to be able to drop everything and run and you know there have been times in my life to be honest with you when things like that have happened where I've, I've hesitated felt that hesitation within me you know because I have all these things that I have to do you know and you know something like that comes up which should be at the heart of my priesthood you know to be with someone when they're dying and to give them what's most important and I can be more worried about, you know, what's coming, what I, you know, I've scheduled for the day. Okay, so let's move on here. We're, what, what number are we on again? Fifteen. Pardon me? Fifteen. Fifteen. For mercy, patience, and love, as well as the precepts of the aforementioned virtues, in which the good is an essential one, are not to be exercised on account of fasting, but rather fasting on account of them. An effort must be made to acquire by fasting those virtues which are truly good and not to turn the exercise of the virtues toward the goal of fasting. The affliction of the flesh is beneficial and the medicine of hunger should be taken in order that thereby we might be able to attain to love. Therein lies the permanent good which is stable and not subject to the vicissitudes of time. For the disciplines of medicine goldsmithing, and other skills that exist in this world are not pursued for the sake of the instruments that pertain to the work, but rather the tools are made for the sake of the skill. Beautifully said. I don't know if, any, if you could say it more clearly and perfectly than that, that our, our fasting is meant to lead to other virtues and especially to love. As these are useful to experts, so they are useless to those who are not acquainted with the discipline of the skill. And as these are of great assistance to the former, who make good use of them to accomplish their work, so they can be of no assistance at all to the latter, who, ignorant of the reason why they are designed, are content just with possessing them, because they place the sum of their usefulness in merely having them and not in achieving a task. The essentially best thing, then, is that on account of which the indifferent things are done, this chief good itself, however, is not pursued for any reason other than its own goodness alone. And so, like, for Lent, you know, often I think we will take things up and, you know, again, for a, uh, having a sense of discipline or maybe cutting a few pounds, uh, you know, but not necessarily for the end there, which is to help us overcome certain vices or to help us to love more or to pray more. So it becomes sort of a goal to complete the 40 days of that discipline uh, as an end in itself, and that this somehow will bring us to know the joy of Easter. Uh, but it's, again, more of a worldly joy that, okay, I can be done with that 40-day discipline and go back, return back to my patterns of life. Then it has absolutely no value whatsoever. This is distinguished from others, which we have spoken of as indifferent in these ways. If it is good by itself and not by reason of something else, if it is necessary for its own sake and not for the sake of something else, if it is unchangeably and always good, constantly retaining its own character and never being able to become its opposite, if its removal or cessation cannot be but bring on the gravest evil, if similarly the essential evil, which is its opposite, cannot ever become good. These defining elements by which the character of essential goods is distinguished can never be applied to fasting, for it is neither good by itself nor necessary for its own sake,
because it is properly exercised for the sake of acquiring purity of heart and body, so that the stings of the flesh might be dulled and the peace, a peaceful mind reconciled to its creator. Nor is it unchangeably and always good because we are not ordinarily hurt by its absence. Indeed, sometimes when it is done inopportunely, it ruins the soul. Nor is that which seems opposed to it, that is, the naturally enjoyable taking of food, an essential evil, unless intemperance or sensuality or some other vice accompanies it. It cannot be understood as evil, because it is not what enters the mouth that defiles a person, but the things that come out of the mouth that defile a person. And so whoever derogates from an essential good and exercises it imperfectly and sinfully is pursuing it not for its own sake, but on account of something else. For everything else is to be done for its sake, but it itself is to be sought after for itself alone. So loving is always a good for us. Fasting isn't. It's, it's surprising, you know, coming from a monk and an ascetic, you know, living in the desert, you know, because he almost seems to be really putting fasting in its place, you know, that you know, don't be fooled into thinking that, you know, embracing the ascetical disciplines on their own is going, you know, to make you holy or bring you to where you want to be. Time we oops, let's see. Hmm. I just have a little bit left in this section here before Germanus asks a question. <laughs> so consistently maintaining this understanding of the character of fasting, then we should seek after it with all our strength, while yet knowing that it is only appropriate for us if it is practiced at the right time with the right character and to the right extent, and not fixing all our hopes on it, but making it possible for ourselves, thereby to attain to purity of heart and an apostolic love. For this it is clear then, that fasting for which not only special times have been assigned as to when it should be practiced or omitted, but for which even a certain character and set measure have been determined, is not an essential good, but something indifferent. But the things that are, by an authoritative precept, either commanded as good or forbidden as harmful, are never dependent on particular times, such that what has been prohibited may sometimes be done, for while what has been ordered may sometimes be passed over. For no measure has been set for justice, patience, sobriety, purity, or love, nor, on the other hand, has permission ever been freely given for injustice, impatience, wrath, impurity, or hatred. Hence now that we have said these things about the character of fasting, it seems that there must yet be added the authority of Holy Scripture, by which it may be more clearly proven that fasting neither should nor be constantly maintained. According to the Gospel, the Pharisees, as well as the disciples of John the Baptist, used to fast, while the apostles, being the friends and companions of the heavenly bridegroom, were not yet keeping a fast. The disciples of John believed that they were possessed that they possessed all righteousness because of their fasting, since they were followers of him who, as the outstanding preacher of repentance, offered a model to the whole people by his own example, to the extent that he not only renounced the various kinds of food that are furnished for human requirements, but was even completely ignorant of common bread itself. Now they complained to the Lord and said, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often? whereas your disciples do not fast. In his reply to them, the Lord clearly shows that fasting is not always appropriate and that it is not necessary when some seasonal feast or some occasion for charity presents itself and brings with it the pleasure of a meal. Can, he says, the children of the bridegroom mourn while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. Although he said these words before the resurrection of the body, nonetheless they actually point to the time of Pentecost, during which after his resurrection 
the Lord feasted with his disciples over the course of 40 days, and the joy of his daily presence did not permit them to fast. And so at this point, Germanus begins to ask for even greater clarification about the time between uh, the, the, the time a, uh, after the 40 days, you know, why, why, why through Pentecost itself. So the, the ground has been laid for us, still for yet the, the more important things to come uh, in terms of really how, how we are to live our lives now out in light of this higher calling. You know, all these distinctions are made for us in order then that we might be shown here in the final sections of what is the longest conference of the book, how we are to live the, the life of grace, what that, will, what that will look like for us. Okay. But any questions before we start, stop for the evening or final comments? The passage mm -hmm. of, about mercy and patience and love not to be exercised on account of fasting. I just thought that was so powerful. I feel like most people would have the experience of having exercised more sort of heroic acts of, of patience or endurance or all of these truly good things for the sake of not breaking a Lenten resolution. Uh, than they would at any other time. And it's just, it's such a common experience and it's so tangible and it's kind of breathtaking when he turns it on like that. Like you're using what is the most good and the most beautiful as the servant of something indifferent, like nothing for the sake of fasting. And then the fast is over and like you just throw the fast and all of the far better things out the door. Right. It's yeah, as, as if our fast is a sign of our love for Christ, rather than deepening that capacity to give ourselves over a part of our longing for him. It's switched around. It almost becomes an end in itself, so that one becomes more disappointed if they fail at the discipline than maybe if they fail at love or charity that particular day, or if they fail to pray. It, it's sort of like an indication of how far away we because if if it's the fasting that seems so hard not only is there like a level of sensuality there that's making the fasting so hard that it seems like this heroic act of love but you clearly don't understand the nature of like love or virtue if you think that fasting is the hardest highest thing to yeah, the pinnacle attain to you know it's like oh yeah yeah love and patience and all that stuff but fasting <laughs> like well that's the curious wow. thing because it's sort of like the stepping stone mm -hmm. you know like the first steps that lead us on to what is greater somehow we think that we should be able to leap over those steps but we'll see what Cassian says next time yes yeah, for me the of fasting is, is still more directly connected to Christ's temptation when he explains that we don't live by bread alone mm -hmm. and therefore we are dependent upon something far greater. Right. And that uh, any of these things that we do, practice, ascetical practices, mm -hmm. and just me, mm -hmm. uh, the way I do them is it, it forces that home. I, I'm, you know, I can go without food here for a while, but I'm, I'm going to still breathe. And why is that happening? Well, right. because God's making that yeah. happen. You right. know, everything that's happening is mm -hmm. happening. I could still God. walk. <laughs> <laughs> that's all. Okay. Perfect timing, I think, for us, you know, as we uh, enter into the Easter season to be going through this conference. So, nice springboard then, too, then, for, for the rest of the, the year. And what, what does Easter mean for us? How do we embrace the, the new life? Okay. So we'll stop there for this evening, and won't we? And as always, the Our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from you. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.